uh, once wool has been uh, spun onto a bobbin like this uh -huh. or a spindle as it is uh, on the larger walking or giant wheels or great wheels, uh, it's then um, wound off the bobbin or spindle and onto a reel. Uh, actually, it could be wound onto a reel like this one or this more mechanically advanced clock reel. What we have is the uh, arms of the reel. They radiate out from a hub and on the other side, uh, contained in the box on the reel, we've got uh, a threaded axle. And when I spin or the wheel in a clockwise direction, you can see that the, uh, the axle engages the cog here. And on that cog, we've got a small peg. And when I spin, in the case of this reel, if I spin it 40 times around, you can see that the cog moves in the peg with it. And pop. There we go. And that clicking noise is important in, because it has uh, just alerted me that I have spun um, a complete skein of yarn onto the reel. In this case, our, um, I've wound about 83 yards of wool onto the reel. And so that's a skein. I don't think there was ever a standard length of, uh, for skeins. It varied depending on the, the circumference of the, the wheel on your reel. Oh, once you have the skein, uh, you can um, you either wind it into a ball if you're going to leave your yarn that natural uh, unbleached color, or you can dye it. And it's a lot easier to dye a yarn when it's uh, wound into a skein, and to dye it evenly than it would be if you were to, say, submerse that uh, bobbin into the dye. You wouldn't get an evenly coated or dyed uh, yarn. So, and then once it's dried, then you can, it's easier to dry as well uh, once it's been wound into a skein than it is on a bobbin. And it's cheaper to uh, store. I mean, you're not using any tools to store it. You're just hanging it from a peg, whereas you'd have to have a lot of uh, bobbins on hand if you were to store everything on a bobbin before you were to weave it or uh, knit or crochet. Probably any household that did any sort of um, textile work would have had one. Yeah, probably one that was established, I should say. I mean, otherwise you could use your arm or your husband's arms to wind off the bobbin uh, and uh, onto to create a skein, or your children's arms. You see that a lot in, well, the comics. <laughs> this is a blanket from our collection that used both uh, undyed and dyed wools. And it was, according to this label here, um, made in, oh dear, Y Vale. Uh, the wool itself was carded uh, at the, will, uh, the mill uh, in Wybridge, and it was woven by Francis Victoria Arrington Clute in about 1890. And it was woven on a rather smallish loom because you can see here that it was woven in two pieces, and then there's a central seam and uh, the two pieces were stitched together to create one wider blanket. Okay, I can talk about the loom and uh, weaving process, I guess, if you want. These uh, threads here, these are called the warp threads, the threads that run from the back of the loom toward me. And uh, each thread is, um, you can see if I lift, each thread runs through the eye of a heddle, only one heddle each, and some threads have been run through the eye of the heddle in the fourth frame back here, or the third, or the second, or the first. And it's the different combination of uh, uh, warp threads running through the different uh, numbers in the, or the different heddles in the frames that creates a pattern. This probably wasn't the kind of loom that you'd want to create blankets on. It's a really small one. It might have been, I'm not sure, but it might have been just something used for recreational use or for a child because it's so narrow. If you were to produce a blanket, you'd have to produce yards and yards of really narrow um, uh, yardage. And uh, I just wouldn't look really nice to have one blanket made of a series of panels.
but I guess if that's all you had. Oh, I just think the way, the way texture and color intertwine. And, and, and then it's a nice feeling too to look at something and say, I made that.